Right. So for the final video of this module, we're going to pick up where we left off um, we, when we introduced the concept of hedges and look uh, more deeply into that. Also, um, how it ties into the concept of claims and warranting, which we began talking about a little bit in the last video, and whether or not you should have a separate conclusion section in your article. All right. So if you remember in the first video, this came up, um, this wording, I pointed out how in the abstract of that meat study, how the authors make this move about the, the, the this last sentence is basically the equivalent of the discussion section. And they, they use this word suggest, not the word, a strong word like prove. This suggests that meat consumption has a negative impact not this shows, not certainly not this proves. Well, there's a, there's a reason why authors use this kind of wording. This is called hedging. What is hedging? Here's some here's an example of non-hedging, and you can you can see this in the news. This is uh, the coronavirus is never going away. No matter what happens now, the virus will continue to circulate to circulate around the world. You would almost never see this um, in a research article, this kind of statement, without some kind of hedging. You can make this in, in, a, in, a, in a newspaper or a, um, or a, a blog, um, this, kind of, this kind of assertion with so much confidence. But obviously, when you're talking about trying to um, use, when, you, when a scientist use da uses data, they draw influences um, using the data. And since they involve inferences, then it's, it's not possible to make such strong generalizations. But in fact, even in the news, um, you don't often see this kind of confidence. So here you have some other examples of, of hedging. So here the coronavirus deaths at 20 year high, but peak may be over, not peak is over. Uh, dip in new COVID-19 cases likely due to significant delay, not is due. Health experts warn COVID-19 could have, la long, have lasting effects on the body, not will have. Coronavirus tests suggest 1.4 million in Italy have antibodies, not, not tests show, tests suggest. So those are some examples of um, hedging. And here you have one that's really hedged. Can you get COVID-19 through your eyes? Possibly. Should we all be wearing goggles? Probably not. Um, and you can understand why an author would hedge with something like this, because if you think of the context here, first of all, there was very little knowledge at this stage that this article came out about COVID-19, relatively speaking, and um, how it can be treated and how even it can be caught. I mean, it's still, it was still relatively new. There was still a question of whether or not COVID-19 could be caught through one's eyes. Um, and so there, there was limited evidence. So therefore, the possibly, not yes. Should we all be wearing goggles? Probably not. You wouldn't, you would be, it would be totally irresponsible to say no. Because if one said no, that would mean, imagine the implications, the, the, the irresponsibility. Then those who read this article will say, okay, well, then I'm not going to wear goggles. But there is the possibility at least the evidence would show, according to that the evidence reported in this article, that wearing goggles could actually be beneficial to preventing um, COVID-19. And so it has to be hedged. So those are examples of hedging. Hedging, again, is something that is ubiquitous, something that is really important, especially in the discussion section. So just a kind of succinct definition. In academic writing, a hedge is a word or phrase used by the author authors to show they are being careful about their claims. They're, they're, they're being thoughtful and reflect, uh, reflective. They're not just kind of making crazy, overconfident claims. So getting back to this article that we saw in an earlier video in this module, it's one that generated so much debate um, and conversation in the literature. Um, the uh, hydroxychloroquine um, debates. Uh, the authors say this, um, 
the, the cause for a failure of hydrochlor hydrochlor hydrochloroquine treatment should be investigated by testing the isolated SARS-CoV-2 strains of the non-respondents and analyzing their genome and by analyzing the host factors that may be associated with the metabolism of hydrochloroquine. The existence of hydrochloroquine failure in two patients, mother and son, is more suggestive of the last mechanism of resistance. So we talked about this statement as the authors kind of um, placing blame not on the failure, possible failure of the treatment um, or of even the research design, but of the patients themselves and their genetic makeup. Um, but even in this statement, you see hedging. So by analyzing host factors that may be associated, so there's that may there, the existence of hydrochloroquine failure in two patients, mother and son, is more suggestive of the last mechanism. So they're clear, they, they're careful to say that that's not what it is, but it's suggestive of that. So you'll find that the word suggestion and suggestive uh, or suggests is actually quite common in the discussion section. And here you see it again. Um, and it, it exists uh, to, again, show that the authors are not overstating the importance of the findings. And if you say something that's stronger than that, then it actually weakens um, your, it can, it can weaken uh, your case. Um, if you look at what other authors do, so I here's a mini study I, condu uh, to, I conducted to, sh to show you what I mean. Uh, here you have 191 research articles um, over a span of 10 years, I think it is. <clears throat> and one thing that characterizes uh, these papers is they're all written by uh, native speakers of English. That, this is significant. The, the fact that they're native speakers is only to show that it, what, it, what it can be indicative of is that these writers, who are, are from um, native speakers of English, uh, may feel, have a sense of nuance of what they're saying um, more than speakers of, of, uh, of English when that language is not their first language. And if you put in the word prove, um, and Anconk for, for this mini corpus, uh, it's about uh, I think it's two million words. Um, so not a small corpus, really, but it's a very focused corpus. These All these articles are from food science uh, journals. And if you look for the word proof, then you do see some examples of it. In fact, you see 71 uh, hits here. But if you, look at a, if you look at this qualitatively, you see that there's something interesting going on, that the software has picked up um, not prove in the sense of confirm data, but prove um, in other ways. So there are several examples here of prove plus adjective. So for example, the last line um, here, you have uh, prove difficult um, and prove beneficial up here in line 10. And then you have other things which are just kind of kind of other noise that's been caught, like um, this prevention um, citation here, even proverb. So of these 71 hits, actually, the use of prove in, terms, in the sense of something to prove a result or to prove a point, uh, prove a claim, it's actually very, very few. And you can contrast that. Uh, with oh, here you have some more examples. Same thing, approve plus adjective. Contrast that with the non-native corpus. So you have the same. You have the same number of words, or a very um, co comparable number of words in this corpus. But the all the articles in this case, come from non-native speakers. And here you see that, um, first of all, there are, there are more examples. It's a higher, significantly higher number. But beyond that, the actual use is different. 
So here you look, if you see the number 54 here, this, these results proved the importance. Um, our results proved that, and these kinds of constructions, writing this in a research article, uh, can only sort of can can serve only to irritate uh, the reviewer a bit. Um, that naysayer then can just kind of uh, naturally get a bit defensive and say, "Well, you know, wait a minute. To, to what extent does your result re, do your does your method really give you that sort of confidence to prove that?" Um, there's. Uh, it's safer to say suggest or if you want to say something even strongly say uh, strongly suggest or embellish it with other things like um, we have a, a, a higher degree of confidence that our studies strongly suggest but to actually use the word prove or even the word show um, without any hedging um, is probably just unnecessarily uh, going to awake the critical nature of the naysayer. So hedging is a very important, a very, very important part of the results section. And if you look at um, uh, this, this stretch here of, of text, um, current knowledge allows us, this is from the meat study again, uh, current knowledge allows us only to speculate which what particular compounds and metabolic processes are responsible for, for hedonic changes in body odor after the meat consumption. You can probably identify already a word in that first sentence um, that is um, evidence that the authors are hedging. And it's uh, this word here, uh, speculate. And it, and if you are unfamiliar with the genre of scientific writing, if you just ask a, a group of people who are unfamiliar with um, academic language, and one, you might think, well, you know, speculate, that, that's a word that doesn't belong in science. It's a word that doesn't belong in, um, in, a, in a formal academic uh, genre, but in fact, it's a, it's, it's a very important part of it. And uh, there's this idea that, um, you know, this kind of modality and hedging is something that seems so imprecise that it doesn't have a place in science. But in fact, it's if you are part of a conversation, which all research articles are, then clearly not there's not one person that is 100 um, percent can be 100 percent confident about results and uh, and generalizable to 100 percent or universal um, application. So obviously there is imprecision, and because there's such thing as a method that covers all um, all possible variables, there, there there has to be some degree of hedging. So a word like this doesn't stick out as being funny. It's actually very important. If you remember um, way, way back, a billion years ago, um, in an earlier module, we talked about the title, the abstract, and the introduction. Um, we talked about the the when you're trying to find a title, and it should first of all give you a good indication of what the content is. And one way of helping you find a title is to think about what your claim is. What is what is the claim that you're that you're making? And this one, this title actually makes a very clear claim um, that uh, that there is a burden, and they they also signal that there's evidence. Okay, and this kind of claiming and evidence is something I, I mentioned back then is an important part of argumentation, argument building. I mentioned that there is this restaurant in South America that, that claims that they are the best burger in the world, which is a huge claim, but that claim is weakened by there is no evidence for that. And how uh, when you're building an argument, the more you can be transparent in, in, in that context, I talk about uh, showing how much uh, there need there was a need for the research, um, then the, the more people want to listen to it. And so that transparency and argument building is very important. And again, to recall how the results uh, tie to the introduction and to the 
the title is sort of a driver of of can be a driver of the entire um, of the entire paper. The results, of course, tie to the discussion uh, very importantly, and they also tie um, to the discussion in the sense of uh, you need to hedge your confidence. And so your results can be seen as a kind of evidence. This is the this is your evidence. Um, and if you have that kind of um, evidence there for your for the the, the IMRAD, um, then you have a claim that can be your title. But and when you get to the discussion section, you have to bring both of those things together. You have to be able to make a claim about the results and provide evidence for that. And that's why you have so much hedging. So look at uh, that same stretch of text from the meat study again. Current knowledge allows us to speculate, only to speculate what particular compounds and metabolic processes are responsible for hedonic changes in body odor after the meat consumption. We propose that it could be due to changes in amount and or relative abundance of aliphatic, aliphatic acids. So here you have this kind of imprecise language again. It's what's called epistemic modality. That it could be due to. They need to say that because they, they, the method did not allow for them to, to make 100%, uh, to be 100% confident that that is um, uh, uh, the, that the, um, the hedonic changes in body over work 100% due to um, to the meat consumption. So it could be changes uh, to it could be due to changes in the amount or relative abundance in aliphatic acids. They don't have all the evidence that they need. So this is their claim. This is their kind of saying this is what we think the we can, how we can interpret the data. This is that claim is our claim of how we can interpret the data. If you're going to have that kind of claim, then you need to warrant. And so that's what the rest of this is. They are providing the evidence for that claim here. So um, the axillary region contains abundant numbers of apocrine glands producing milky secretions. Fresh apocrine secretion is odorless, but is rapidly converted by axillary microflora to odorous breakdown products, and so on and so on. And so, um, when they make that claim, could be due to they don't leave it at only that. They also have all of this uh, warranting here. Or evidence. So how do you uh, make a, a conclusion? Well, first of all, just as a reminder of like what we do in real life, uh, when you on the phone, for example, when you conclude, there's always a signal of some kind, right? So uh, you don't just say to somebody over the phone, um, whatever it is, and so, uh, see you Friday and then bye uh, without some kind of uh, some kind of signal and this often occurs when you have somebody who imagine a conversation on the phone with somebody who who's talking for a long time and you have to get off think about what signals you use uh, so you might use a word like anyway or listen, I have to let you go, or whatever that signal may be, but there's some kind of signal. And the same thing occurs in an article. There has to be some kind of signal there that you're winding down. So here I just want to quickly look at um, when you conclude, should you have a separate section? Should it be integrated into the discussion? And um, how do you signal that you're closing, that you're concluding? And what should you include in the conclusion if you have a separate section or not? Well. First of all, as I've said before, you want to make sure that you first check the journal. Uh, look at what 
the journal that you're going to submit to does. Some journals, for example, um, the New England Journal of Medicine, they don't have a they don't have a conclusion section. None of their articles have a conclusion section. It's only a discussion section that then winds down to a kind of conclusion. Um, there are other journals that there is a separate conclusion section. Um, every, always check w what the journal expectations are. Um, if a journal doesn't seem to have any particular preference one way or the other, then look at your mentor texts. Look at the texts that have influenced your research, your writing, and look what those authors do. Because ultimately, in every discipline, there'll be different preferences, different styles. So check your journal and also check, check your mentor texts. So to give you an example from the American Journal of Medicine, uh, here in the study, association between patient reported medication adherence and anticoagulation control. Uh, it's a clinical research study. Here you see that there is a separate conclusion section, which is often the case in this particular journal. And it's because there's a conclusion title, then there's no reason to signal that it's a conclusion because it just it's there in the subheading or in the heading. And in the conclusion, you see that they, they make these moves. So medication non-adherence is an important public health issue, especially for patients taking OACs. Um, clin clinicians are currently ill-equipped to address these challenges with few simple tools to accurately identify patients with poor adherence. The VAS is a promising tool to help clinicians ac assess patient adherence that is quick and expensive and easily implemented. So all this here is basically the first part of that conclusion is to say what it does and why it's useful. And then they talk about future studies. Future studies are needed to validate our findings and determine whether self-reported medication adherence can predict outcomes for patients taking anticoagulation and improve their safety. So here you have the same kind of moves that you see in the introduction section you see in the conclusion section whatever you want to highlight and um it's keep in mind it's the last thing that the author is going to read or rather the reader is going to read you can put it there and the moves um that this as i mentioned in 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 the video when we talked about um the discussion section there's a kind of logical sequence to this and this follows that where you the last thing the last move here is this um, nod to the future. Another example, um, a, an article that I looked at myself from the Clinical Kidney Journal, uh, Seve, uh, Sevilamer reduces endothelial inflammatory response to advanced gly glycation end products. And, um, and this article, they have similarly a conclusion section. And even though they have a conclusion section, uh, they kind of tautologically have this uh, statement here. So even, even if you have a conclusion section title, you can still have this. Um, in conclusion, this study demonstrates in vitro that the anti-inflammatory effects of sevalimer on endothelial cells and monocytes may be due not only to its classic effect on phosphate, but also to its binding capacity to AGEs and possibly other uremic toxins. So may might be considered a therapeutic option to reduce the high AGE levels um, observed in pathological conditions such as CKD and perhaps diabetes, regardless of the presence of hyperphosphatemia. In the future, clinical studies should be designed to validate the potential capacity of Sevalimer to decrease systemic AGEs and uremic serum concentrations. Thus, it is hypothesized that this clinical treatment could provide a beneficial benefit on vascular function, yielding and relevant clinical outcomes. So here you see moves again that you have in the first instance, the first part of the conclusion to kind of recap um, what they what the study did, what, what study shows. Then you have um, uh, its application that it could be considered a therapeutic option and then you have this kind of nod to the future um, and 
even again here. So the same moves that you would have in the discussion section, you'd have in the conclusion section with the same kind of sequence. But you also have the naysayer present here. You may have noticed this as I was reading, that you have these may and might and could and so on, um, where the authors are kind of speculating or suggesting, they're making suggestions, they're speculating a little bit, they're interpreting, and therefore the these hedges, they're reflect that. And so even though you're in a different section, in this case the conclusion section, the hedging still remains. Another example from this one from um, the journal Food Quality and Preference, the dynamics of food breakdown during eating in relation to perceptions of texture and preference, a study on biscuits. I love studying about food because I love food, I guess. And then here you have um, at the conclusion section, and in this journal, this journal again is the, the Food Quality and Preference Journal, they always have a conclusion section, but they also always have a bullet-pointed conclusion section. Thus, this here reinforces my point about how you should look at what the journal does that you intend to submit to. And um, here you see, even though it is um, a bullet-pointed um, conclusion, you have moved. So the first bullet point, the oral breakdown path for biscuits differed between consumers and was related to subjects chewing efficiencies with almonds and chewing gum. Two, the breakdown path may be determined by the mechanical actions employed. Um, and here you have the, that word again. Subjects arrived at similar sensory judgments of specific texture attributes, but Differ, different relationships between attributes and may use different markers to assess particular texture attributes. Preference may be a function of the relative ease of oral breakdown of a sample and differences in preferences among consumers may be due to them finding different samples easier to manage orally. So here you have a recap and you have um, an explanation or extrap ex extrapolation of results. And since they are explaining and extrapolating, i.e interpreting, you have all of those um, instantiations of um, modality, this hedging. Can the discussion and conclusion sections be integrated? Yes, of course, um, and they often are. And here you have uh, that study I, I showed in an earlier video talking about the importance of limitations. And in that article, um, that, is, that is what happens. They integrate the conclusion into the discussion, and they signal it with this. In conclusion, our data show that reporting of limitations to original biomedical research is probably incomplete, either directly through clinical decision-making by evidence-based clinicians or indirectly through its effects on systematic reviews and clinical guidelines. Optimal patient care may be jeopardized. Finally, Scientific progress may be slowed down. Reporting limitations more completely would aid in the, aid the design and implementation of future studies. An appropriate amount of hedging, given these limitations, could further guide future scientific inquiries. So it's the irony they're talking about hedging, and they use hedging talking about the hedging. But here the relevant point is that you can see that they signal quite well um, that they're winding down. It's not the phone just hanging up suddenly. There is a signal uh, to the reader that they are winding down. It's a nice little wind down there. And in that winding down, they make moves. Um, in this case, uh, it, they're talking about the paths to the future. They mention the future um, uh, for, for further research and future um, it, uh, implications uh, quite a bit. Here's a different um, journal, again, from the Medical Sciences, Journal of Dermatological Science, and uh, on psoriasis. And I chose this because uh, here you can see a very sh a much shorter conclusion, but nonetheless it is signaled. So it's just simply the word, in conclusion, an increase in, da, 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 
coupled with decrease in blah, 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 was observed in blah, blah, blah compared to, uh, then this suggests that the IL-17A pathway may play an important part in PPPP pathogenesis. And so it's, it's much shorter, but again, it's signaled, and um, the moves that are described in the introduction, they are there, uh, recapping what happened, what they found, and then what the, the implication is using the word suggests. Um, here is something a little bit different. It's a short communication. It's still within the genre of research article. And I talked about this before in, in the context of choosing a title. Um, this one in the, in the field of biological conservation. And uh, these were the subjects, apparently. And look how they signal. Um, the, here, the, the conclusion is integrated in the discussion, and they just signal with this word overall. These data provide a mixed message for wildlife managers. On the one hand, both the lack of a difference in initial corticosterone uh, uh, concentrations and the low levels compared to animals affected by El Nino conditions indicates that um, marine iguanas are not being chronically stressed by current levels of tourism, thereby avoiding the negative effects of chronically ev ev elevated corticosterone uh, can cause. The good news uh, should be tempered with the potential that the tourist exposed iguanas long-term survival may be compromised since their lower corticosterone's response uh, to a stressful stimulus may limit the beneficial effects of acute corticosterone release. So it's signaled here, but also the moves, look at the moves that they do. So they extrapolate on the data. It's an, they kind of are explaining what the meaning is there to the reader. And then they talk about um, the implications of this with this word potential and beneficial um, effects may, that may be limited um, by the points that they raise here. Another brief report uh, in the Journal of Autism uh, Developmental Disorders. And this is where they, in this report, they talk about a theory of mind inventory, abbreviated as TOM. And you can identify the moves here. This study supports the importance of a theory of mind inventory as a valid parent report measure of theory of mind among parents of adolescents with ASDs. This is an important step in the advancement of theory of mind research. And um, and they and they go on, and then they signal the end at the end of this paragraph with, in summary, we propose the continued and expanded use of the theory of mind inventory and research findings to advance its potential for clinical application. They even mention the word application here. And so the moves here um, are in application here in the first part. And then they talk about the the way it can be applied in the future. Um, but the, port, the important part is that it's signaled and it's integrated into the discussion section. This is an example from the Journal of Food Policy. Um, altruism, reciprocity and health, a social experiment, restaurant choice. So a completely different uh, or very different one from the uh, medical field ones I showed in the previous examples. And what you see here is that there's just this one paragraph conclusion, and it's signaled by an indentation only, really. And they say, while additional research should be conducted to replicate and broaden our findings, our results are nonetheless an exciting starting point for examining how trust and altruism and food choice might be integrated into public health initiatives. So you have, as a move, you have how 
this applies to future research, how their study applies to future research. Um, and they kind of, they end up end on this high note um, that um, they, they kind of hint at limitations that their study is one study that should be replicated in order to broaden the, 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 the application or the applicability of the results, but they are nonetheless an exciting starting point for examining how trust and altruism and food choice might be integrated into public health initiatives. Um, and so they end with this kind of future application, but on a kind of, yes, it's not something that you can just take and integrate yet into um, public health initiatives, but it paves a way towards that end. So uh, here you have something in a kind of a more uh, business area, mathematics business, um, the European Journal of Operational Research. And in this journal, um, you have uh, usually articles that don't have a separate conclusion section, just an in, in incorporated discussion section. Again, the it is not indicated with a subheading or anything or even a discourse marker. It's just a, it's just an indentation. And uh, what they say is the presented model is only a first step to 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 understand the impact of force allocation in a three opponent combat. The next step to understand optimal strategy in a combat with three opponents would be to consider allocation, which depend on the size of the state variables. This would capture a situation where the opponents adjust their allocation strategy by means of a feedback rule to prevent any of the opponents to become too dominant. The obvious extension would be to consider the allocation rate as a control variable and determine when it is optimal to attack each opponent. The possibility of a temporary cooperation would lead to many challenges in a differential game setup. What's interesting here is that, as you can see, there are several moves about future and application in the research here that there are there are moves upon uh, apparent but there is no signal here in terms of in summary or in conclusion or anything like that but the last sentence the possibility of a temporary cooperation would lead to many challenges in a differential game setup is kind of like their final word uh, to kind of again like the sim the last example to propose something exciting um, kind of ending on a on a high note, as it were, to transition to whatever the next study related to this one might be. So that kind of winds up our our module, um, our penultimate module uh, for this course. And as you can see, the as you have seen over the last between the last module and this module, the discussion section like the introduction section, is one that needs to be constructed very carefully. Um, many courses on academic writing do focus on the introduction section, maybe not even at the depth that we have done in this course. But often they don't talk about the discussion section. And uh, here we've devoted a lot of time to the discussion and conclusion sections because both of those sections have been proven to, to be very difficult, um, or especially challenging for writers, especially uh, less experienced writers. And um, especially in the case of the discussion section, uh, there are a number of ingredients that, that are kind of implicitly expected as, when a, a reviewer um, comes to that section. And now hopefully you know um, which ones are there uh, that you can include to strengthen your point, including uh, talking about the limitations, which as, we, we've, as we've discussed, um, can actually serve to uh, improve the 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 chances of your article being seen as being one that's meaningful um, and as well as even hedging your statements so uh, that wraps it up for the writing portion of this course we've talked about the imrad in, in general especially the the introduction and the discuss and the discussion sections in the next module uh, we're going to be talking about okay now you've written your research article and you submit it, um, what else is there to it? And there is a lot more to talk about. So uh, we'll see you there.